Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome and good evening, and thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Claire, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I'm pleased to introduce this virtual event with Catherine Blake presenting her debut book, The Uninnocent, Notes on Violence and Mercy. She'll be in conversation with Mina Harris. Through virtual events like tonight's, Harvard Bookstore continues to bring authors and their work to our community and our growing digital community during these challenging times. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight in support of our authors and the incredible staff of booksellers at Harvard Bookstore. Uh, we sincerely appreciate your support now and always. Uh, every week we're hosting a ton of virtual events and our schedule appears on our website at harvard.com events, where you can also sign up for our email newsletter and even browse our shelves from home. Uh, this time of year, we also have a lot of great gift ideas up online too. Uh, after the introduction, I will drop a link in the chat to order a copy of uh, Catherine's book, your purchases and financial contributions. I'll also be sharing a link to donate, make this virtual author series possible, and now more than ever support the future of a landmark independent bookstore. This evening's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. If you have a question for our speakers at any time during the talk tonight, you can just go to the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and we'll get through as many as time allows. Uh, this event also has closed captioning available. Depending on which version of Zoom you're using, you may need to enable the captions yourself by clicking on the closed caption button on your screen. Uh, and finally, as you may have experienced in virtual gatherings over the past year and a half now, uh, technical issues might arise, and if they do, we'll do our best to resolve them quickly. Thank you for your patience and understanding. Uh, Catherine Blake is an adjunct professor at Vermont Law School's Center for Justice Reform. Uh, during law school, she served as, well, while she was in law school, she served as the editor of the Stanford Law and Policy Review. Uh, Catherine has taught English at San Quentin Prison and served as director of special projects for the Children's Defense Fund. Tonight, she'll be talking with Mina Harris, an author, lawyer, producer, and founder of Phenomenal. An expert in consumer protection, data privacy, and cybersecurity, she is a stalwart advocate for gender equity. She's also the author of the best-selling Ambitious Girl. During the summer after Catherine's first year of law school, her teenage cousin, cousin suffered a psychotic break and killed a child. That awful moment not only ended the life of the child and led to her cousin being sentenced to life imprisonment, but it also shaped Blake's path forward. Her debut, The Uninnocent, is a powerful book that is part memoir, part exploration of the legal system. In a starred review, Publishers Weekly calls it intimate and deeply moving. And for Library Journal, Anita, Anitra Gates writes, this introspective book covers some disturbing and unsettling ground, yet appropriately so because of the subject matter. Readers looking to explore the ideas of mercy and forgiveness will be given plenty to think about. Uh, and so now I am pleased to turn the podium over uh, to our speakers. Uh, the digital podium is yours, uh, Catherine and uh, Mina. Awesome. Thank you so much, Claire. It is so lovely to be here virtually and back at Harvard. Uh, I have to admit, as much as I wish this was in person, I'm glad it is not in person in Cambridge this time of year. Uh, but I'm so happy to be back um, with the Harvard community and, and especially in conversation with Catherine. Catherine, uh, first, I just have to say how kind of surreal this is. We've mm -hmm. known each other now for ever. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. I think before we both were law students mm -hmm. and um, have sort of crossed each other, crossed paths in all, different phases of our lives. Mm -hmm. And now here we are as um, authors. And yeah. wow, just what an extraordinary thing you have done in putting this out into the world. So congratulations. I'm so happy to be here with you. And um, I want to get right into our conversation. You, so first of all, look at this amazing book. Um, you wrote this book. Does that, how does that feel? Uh, it's out in the world, The Uninnocent. And earlier um, you referred to it as your diary. Mm. How, how has this process been for you? And for those who have not yet read the book, um, tell us what it's about and, and how you came to write it. Sure. So um, thank you, Mina. Thank you for doing this with me. It's so nice to talk to you uh, again. I think the last time we really talked was like maybe on a plane, like accidentally I, on the same plane back to California or something. So 
it's nice. To I be know there. it's, it's wild. Yeah. And I hope that we do get to get together in person soon because it's I been, know. we have like kids now. I mean, so, so much so has happened. Kids. Yeah, exactly. A <laughs> hundred kids. Um, so yeah, thank you. Um, yeah. You know, when I, when I called it my diary, I just meant that there's something so, um, vulnerable about writing and publishing a book. Um, and I think that's true no matter what book you're publishing. I think it's true no matter what you're making and putting out in the world, honestly. And you probably know something about this. Like anytime you're making things um, and other people are offering feedback or um, consuming them in some way, you know, you just feel, you feel it, you feel vulnerable. Mm -hmm. um, and this book is also just um, very personal. It's intensely personal. It's um, personal to me and it's about my family. And so you know, um, reviews feel, you you feel them in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, but so for those who haven't read it, I thought um, Claire's introduction was um, was so kind and, and helpful in, in um, giving people kind of a synopsis. But I'll just add a little bit to say that um, even though one of the central stories in the book is about my cousin who committed this crime, um, it, it, you know, the, that crime just raised so many questions for me um, mm -hmm. as a law student, you know, as somebody who was about to go out into the legal profession. Um, and then, but also as a person, like, because uh, it made me realize this thing that I think we all have to realize at some point, which is that anything can happen to you and your, your, your worst case scenario or, um, you know, your worst imagined heartbreak like you're not protected from that. You know, there's no reason. I think that we all have this tendency to read articles in the newspaper about tragedies and think that doesn't, ha that won't happen to me. Mm -hmm. Like that doesn't happen to somebody like me, whatever that means. Um, and, and the truth is that it, it does and it can. And so, oh, you know, what does it mean to like, to live your life really fully um, embracing that truth. So that's what the book is about. Also, I really dive into this concept of heartbreak um, and, and explore it from a lot of different angles mm -hmm. in the legal system and then also more broadly. And I know some folks, you know, are, there's lots of different people here with lots of different, I think, you know, interests and actually we'll remind everyone as Claire did that we do have um, Q and A at the end. So please submit your questions in, in the um, chat feature. Um, but do you want to, so I, I mean, I have so many questions for you, but, um, and one that came to mind was, you know, this is, as you said, deeply personal. And it's something mm -hmm. that came out of your own experience. I, on the other hand, you're someone who was a law student, who is now a law professor, who, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, were, was living in, in, in San Francisco and teaching at San Quentin. You had interacted with the system, mm -hmm. um, if from a, you know, clinical perspective or, you know, um, educational perspective, however you, or academic, however you think of that. And one of the things that comes up for me is, you know, criminal justice is, um, or the, you know, the uh, criminal legal system and the um, the harm that it creates in yeah. uh, society is something that to me is is a is an issue that I care so much about, mm -hmm. and it's something that I think in part was informed by my family and my mm -hmm. exposure to that through mm -hmm. education and conversation and and all those things. And one of the things I wonder is, you know, for someone like you, this personal thing happened, as you said, mm -hmm. the most unlikely unexpected thing. And that's what sort of pushed you to write this book. I almost want to start from the other direction, which is like, how do we get people to yeah. engage in this conversation yeah. and to think about these, you know, concepts around justice and, and mercy and redemption and you know, again, the harm of this system without having a personal connection to it, right? Without um, having to have that be the, or not not having to have it be, but that being something that's, it has to be that tangible and concrete, yeah. right? Um, so I'm curious, like you kind of have these two different experiences, yeah. one is, right, someone outside of it and then someone who then experienced it unexpectedly. But how do you think about that for yourself as well as for a lay audience um, and regular ordinary people who are going about their lives who we mm -hmm. want to engage in this dialogue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that is the million dollar question for all advocates everywhere. How do you get people to imagine realities other than their own? Yeah. Why are people only willing to dive into an issue when it touches them personally? Um, I mean, I think <laughs> this is like a very self-serving answer, but I think one of the ways you can do it is maybe by telling stories and, and reading books. You know, mm -hmm. I think that like a good 
a good book can change the way that you think about something, you know, yeah. or really listening to another person's story is so that even if it doesn't affect your life, you've really, the, that person who's telling the story has made you know how it felt for them in such an immediate way um, that the imagination can like make that leap into caring about an issue. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, I mean, I think that's one of the best tools at our disposal, but I know, I mean, I just, it, and when you ask that question immediately, I was thrown back to this moment, which I actually discuss in the book about being at the Children's Defense Fund. And when um, Sandy Hook happened, when the shooting in Newtown happened. And, you know, I remember so clearly, like one of the things, because the Children's Defense Fund had been working on gun safety legislation for decades, right? right. They had been putting out reports like every year about how many children were killed by guns for the last, you know, I don't know, 20 years they've been doing it. And then this event happened where, you know, over 20 children were killed and they weren't just children in the inner city, right? These weren't black and brown children who the country has a much easier time ignoring or forgetting. These were largely white children in an upper middle class suburb. And I think a lot of people who had been working at this for a really long time thought, okay, like we are gonna get people to care about this now, mm -hmm. right? Like America, this is this is less of an imagine, imagination leap that's required. We're gonna get people to care about. And we still couldn't get legislation passed. You know, we still couldn't do it. Um, there are some things that are just so entrenched in, in American society. And I think, anyway, blah, blah, blah. I don't want to go on too long, but. Um, but I, yeah, I think you made an important point too, which is again, the power of storytelling and that, yeah. you know, each of us should um, tell our stories and there's real connection and power in that, even if it's something that someone can't directly relate to. And then of course, though, um, again, in the, in the context of this conversation of, of equity and right, who gets to tell their stories, who has access to mm -hmm. be able to tell their stories, who mm -hmm. um, is able to, and then get can get other people to care about that, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, you talked about imagination and imagining, and you know, it's something that um, in the context of you know the criminal legal system and abolitionism, which yeah. is what that the question is: Can you imagine a world that we don't yet know, mm -hmm. that has not yet existed, that we are wanting to believe in and imagine? You know what it what it might look like if we didn't have these power structures and, and harmful systems in place. And so I think you know back to your point. This is an event about your book, and I mean it, they, these are tools, right? It's not on its own sufficient. And right. um, you know I think it, that it is important to recognize the power in in storytelling yeah. and um, you know for us to engage in that sort of dialogue uh, and, and know that that resonates with, you know, ordinary people who, you know, again, I think it, you, you do such a great job of, of creating that both very intimate, personal, emotional connection, but then um, uh, in this very personal experience, but talking about it within this much broader system, yeah. right. And um, yeah. the, you know, change that needs to happen in that system. Um, I want to go back to sort of your, you know, journey, right? Um, we talked earlier, you, you went to Stanford Law School, yeah. um, you spent time um, teaching at San Quentin. I'm curious uh, how those experiences, you know, before this happened, informed your perspective and then further informed after it did and you decided to write the book, yeah. um, having sort of been immersed in the space, but as, you know, uh, someone who was not in, involved with the, the system personally. Yeah. Sure. So, yeah, I mean, I think I, I went to law school with really lofty ideals, as a lot of people do. You know, I really thought that the law was the best tool we had for creating a more just world. Um, I had been on the Barack Obama campaign, which is how I know you. And, um, and I had seen some, you know, some crazy stuff, like some real, some true injustice in terms of the way that the police were interacting with the community that I was organizing in, um, like voter intimidation. I mean, really just like straight illegal. Um, and, and, and so I, so I decided to go to law school and then I got to law school and, you know, I was sitting in civil procedure and it's like, no, like this is not what I thought it was going to be. I don't like oh, having like PTSD, just been hearing you talk about civil I procedure. Don't. Don't talk. I know, and they use the um, the Socratic method at Harvard still, right? Do yeah. they? Yeah, they yeah. did in my classes too. So it was just like every day sitting down and just being so afraid. Anyway, so I didn't feel like we talked very much about justice that first year, um, 
And I had a lot of doubt, but then I had a lot of doubt about what I was doing and why and whether I had made the right choice. Um, but by the end of the year, I kind of had like maybe got some footing and maybe had some ideas about what I was going to do. But then my cousin's crime happened that summer after my first year. Mm -hmm. And when I went back to school, I really had a hard time caring about anything that I was supposed to care about, mm -hmm. like moot court and trial advocacy and, um, you know, law review and even clerkships. Like it all just felt so, it just felt like a farce. <laughs> like it just felt mm -hmm. like we were like playing pretend. Meanwhile, um, like courtrooms were deciding the fates of real people um, and not all that well all the time, you know? So it, it, it was like this big um, disillusionment. Mm -hmm. um, but then I found the community law clinic, mm -hmm. which does direct service work in East Palo Alto. And my mom worked at the community law clinic. Really? And, uh huh. And mm -hmm. I have uh, vivid memories of I was four, and you know she took wow. me along with her often, including to class. Yeah. But I have vivid memories of that, and uh, and the work, the, the important work that the organization does in East Palo Alto. So yeah. I just found my home there. Like, yeah, yeah. I was like, oh, this is what I was talking about. You know, right. this is the work. Like this, we are actually, we are doing the work, you know? Yeah. And um, I just, felt, I fell in love with it. And I also felt like it was the first version of a professional person. Like the women who ran that clinic were the first people I had seen in the law school environment that I felt like I could want to be like. Yeah. Yeah. Which I just hadn't seen at all. You know, my, yeah, you rarely interact. I mean, unless you're yeah. involved with organizations and you're sort of self-selecting into that because you have a, a passion yeah. for it. Um, you know, you don't encounter many practitioners and you don't encounter, right. Um, people who are actually doing yeah. as you said, you're actually doing the work. Uh, yeah. so yeah. yeah. Going. So then, um, so then, you know, I kind of found a home there and, and, and then, I started making choices and I talk about this a little bit in the book that I started making choices to get involved in juvenile justice and to teach at a juvenile just um, detention center. Um, but it was all very opaque. Like I wasn't exactly making conscious, I wasn't making connecting the dots in my own mind between what had happened to my cousin and my choices. Like I was mm -hmm. kind of more unconscious at this point. Um, so looking back, I see that these things were very connected and that I started caring about these things for a reason. But at the time, um, I was just kind of like fumbling through my life, you know, as we all were in our 20s, like trying to figure out what we were going to do with our lives with law degrees. Um, but looking back, it's just so clear that this impacted me and mm -hmm. um, really changed my understanding of how this was all going to work in my own life. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I want to. Um... I mean, oh, there's so many directions. This car. I, like, I want to ask you so many questions too. I mean, there's so much I can learn from you. And I, I wish I had known ahead of time how many law students are in the audience because I'm now realizing that there probably are quite a few um, given, given the host. Uh, you know, you mentioned earlier being on the Obama campaign and maybe for the first time um, observing, right, interactions with uh, communities with police that... Yeah felt um, unjust and unfair. And what I think about in the context of your book, right, with your your cousin who was 16 years old, he was experiencing a psychological break is that, you know, and th this, the the book, is, we're talking really about the prison system and, and the criminal legal system, but also um, the sort of all the layers, you know, before you get there, including interactions with the police and that, mm -hmm. Um, you know, there's some, I don't have it on me now, but some incredible statistic, right, of uh, police interactions and violence stem yeah. from encounters with individuals who are experiencing mental health issues. Yeah. Uh, right. And, and I know that, you know, the perspective that you take in the book is, is one of being a family member and a, and a cousin um, and, and the story of your, your cousin's um, crime, but also other, you know, um, stories around being a mother. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, your cousin was only 16 years old and experienced, I mean, there's just so many different humanizing also layers to this. And yeah. yeah, I want to hear about, you know, how you thought about that when you were writing, writing the book and, and what the ultimate sort of takeaway you want is, you know, for people. Oh, the ultimate takeaway. Right, that was like five questions wrapped into <laughs> it was, it was one. Long. I'll just respond. I'll throw yeah. something back at you. you can... Awesome. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, I think you're right that like what, 
so I become a mother in the book. Like that's one of the things that happens too, is that I narrate that experience. And I do feel that for me, and there's a lot of ways to, to understand things differently. Like becoming a mother is not the only way to understand a deeper compassion for all people, but it was a doorway for me. Like when I had my child and even when I was pregnant, when I was pregnant is when I went to go visit my cousin for the first time at Angola. Mm. And, um, there was something about that experience of being pregnant and then being with him for the first time and seeing him for the first time since this crime, it just, it hit home so powerfully that he too was a baby in his mother's belly, you know, that he who had done this terrible thing and somebody who was going to be known for the rest of his life for the worst thing he had ever done was just a baby. You know, he was just a baby. And and that all people are just babies. And we know this intellectually, but um, but becoming a mother was certainly a way in for me to understand like the, the decency and dignity that all people should be treated with no matter what they have done. Mm-hmm. You know, so even if there are some people that we deem too unsafe to be free, even if incapacitation is like one of the main goals that we are going to hold on to in our criminal legal system, um, the way that that person is imprisoned needs to be radically changed. Yeah. Right. Because I want to put a fine point on that too, because I appreciate you, you clarifying that and that I, I might caught myself saying you humanized this, yeah. right. Through that experience and through the context of your cousin experiencing a psychological break. And that in some ways um, is a more, you know, maybe that's a story that's easier to sympathize with or right. And I think you're making a even more important point, which is, no matter what you did, no matter what the circumstances Mm -hmm. are, everyone deserves, Mm -hmm. right. That, um, what, what would you say? Is it, how do you, what is it? Redemption? Is it mercy? I think mercy, right. That's the word I use in the book the most. And I got, I mean, I really, uh, that word felt truest to me, but it came straight from Brian Stevenson. Like, yeah, I wanted to ask you about any influences that, you know, Brian, um, has had on you. And yeah. let me uh, just, uh, hope, hopefully everybody here knows who Brian Stevenson is, yeah. uh, but founder and executive director of the Equal Justice Initiative, author of Just Mercy, uh, which gosh, I mean, that came out now 2014, 2015. Yeah. Okay. So he wrote Just Mercy. It came out in 2014. There's of course a movie, it was adapted into a movie, which came out, um, I think two years ago. Uh, it feels like that was such a long time ago now. Right. Mm -hmm. And of course this conversation continues and I think it's extraordinary to appreciate how much it's evolved in the last Mm -hmm. seven years, but again, how much more we wrote work we have to do and and room room to go. So yeah, I'd love to hear about Brian's influence on you and how you think about Mm -hmm. this, you know, here today in the context of what he wrote seven years ago. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, so I, um, that was the other big thing that happened right after my cousin's crime as I got back to school and I was feeling really disillusioned. And, um, and then Brian came to speak at the law school in October. He was accepting an award and I had never heard of him before that. So this was 2010. Mm -hmm. Um, and so this was my introduction to him and what he, and the work he was doing. And I mean, Mina, you know, he's just like, he's incredible. When he speaks, everything stops. Yeah. You know? And I think it's worth noting his book was only 2014, but he has doing, been doing this yes. work forever if, exactly. you know, from day one. So yeah. Exactly. Yes. And he, and he really spoke with the conviction of somebody who had dedicated his whole life to this. Right. Right. You know? Exactly. And so you know, and there, and there he was talking about representing young people who had done, you know, who had committed violent crimes um, and talking about them in terms of this beautiful idea that we are more than the worst thing we've done. Mm-hmm. And he also talked about being willing and, and brave enough to like bear witness to darkness, yeah, you know, going into the dark places mm-hmm. in order to bear witness to them. Mm-hmm. And I think I had been feeling a lot of darkness, you know, in that time, like after this crime. Um, and, and so I felt, I just felt hope. Like I felt, again, it was another, it was like the community law clinic insofar as it gave me an example of what, oh, 
okay, like you can do that with a law degree, Mm -hmm. you know, you can do that work that he's doing, um, or that's what justice really sounds like. That's justice. Like I got it. But you know, what's true about Brian Stevenson is that as he says in his book, as he explained so clearly, um, he is not talking about fairness, right? He's talking about justice and justice Mm -hmm. necessarily includes mercy. Mm -hmm. It's like Mm -hmm. absolutely necessary ingredient. Mm -hmm. Um, and, he and what, like, what does justice mean to you? I think about this, you know, in the context of what happened yeah. last summer with George Floyd and we've been having, I think, you know, really important dialogue. I, I hope that is followed up by much more action, um, but that I felt much more evolved and, 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 you know, progressive than I had seen in, in years before that, certainly. But, you know, there, there is this um, uh, clear conversation around what does justice mean? And justice is for some people not a verdict, not a guilty verdict yeah. of you know the officer who murdered him. It would be him still living, yeah. right? That so. What does that mean to you? What does justice mean to you in the context of um, your own sort of framework around all of this, but also in the context of what happened with your cousin? Yeah, sure. So I, I struggle with this a lot. You know, in the book, I I um I spend time here because I think it's really important. Well, so backing up, you know. I, I had this op-ed in the Washington Post a couple of weeks ago, and I didn't read any of the comments, but um, others did. And they sort of gave me like the tone of them. And people were very, very angry mm-hmm. um, and really angry that one of the main themes was like this idea that, of course, your cousin should be in prison for the rest of his life. He should have worse. He should you know, he should be get the death penalty for what he did. Um, so for me coming from where I'm coming from, it's like, I can't believe we're still talking about the death penalty. Like, can we right. move on? Like what the heck? But, but that I, you know, that is just fairness. Like people get stuck on fairness. It's eye for an eye. It's like this received thinking that's just been passed down generation after generation that if somebody takes a life, they should give their life. And, you know, if somebody killed my child, would I want to kill that person with my bare hands? Yes. The answer is yes. Do I believe that's what the state should do? No. And can that's I, I, I would go in on this too, because you, you, you're saying that that is your, your um, char- characterizing that as fairness, which is interesting yeah. in that I also want to talk about um, punishment and mm-hmm. how punitive, mm-hmm. right? We are as a society, you, you mentioned going to Angola, right? One of the worst, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, prison conditions in the country. And so how do you think about this concept of we are, we, we think it's fairness or we've been told it's fairness or it's eye for an eye, but even um, rethinking how we, I I think we've evolved from that. Right. Again, but how, like even um, unpacking the fact that that is considered fair versus overly punitive or motivated by punishment, which is a, is, is maybe a different way of thinking about that too. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I, I I think as a country, we have just gotten s- completely too used to extreme punishment being right. the only goal of the criminal legal system, right? So you're right. It's not just um, if you take a life, you should have to give up your free, you know, the freedom of your life. It's that you should not only have to give up your freedom, you should be um, put in solitary confinement and right. which is torture, right? Right, right. So, or a death, death penalty or put to death, right? I mean, it, it's, right. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I think, I, we, you know, our American exceptionalism like comes out over and over again in terms of criminal justice, criminal, the criminal legal system. And um, we are, you know, there are 2 million people in jail and prison right now. Like mm-hmm. that's more than any other country by far and away. And they're, we're the only country that um, sentences children to die in adult prisons. Like these facts, these only statistics should really wake us up to the fact that we ha- we really do have a problem. We have a sickness um, and it's inspired by and um, propelled by this, exactly what you're talking about, this um, like, I don't know if we've become inured to punishment or we just, we think that justice means punishment 
Right. We don't have, and, it, and this goes back to the beginning of our conversation in terms of imagining other possibilities, because I think what's happened is we've just completely shut down. Like there's no other possible response to someone who breaks the law besides punishment. Mm -hmm. and merciless punishment. And I think the beautiful point that Brian Stevenson makes is that we all suffer in an environment like this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So like even, you know, the people who are, um, who are not in prison or who are not committing crimes, if this is our culture and this is our country, right. We're all suffering in a place that believes um, in merciless sentencing yeah. and merciless responses. Right, right. Um, again, I, I just, I want to, I, I, it's been many years since I was in law school and there's lots of stuff I want to ask you just about details around policy and, and yeah. so much that you're, you become an expert on, but in particular, um, you've talked a lot about, you know, harsh punishment towards juveniles. Again, your cousin was 16, um, when, when this yeah. happened, um, can you, and you mentioned Brian's work also mm -hmm. in that space, but can you talk about that in particular and from a, a policy perspective and sort of maybe, um, you know, advancements we've made and, and where we need to go around life without parole for juveniles, yep. um, also known as LWAP. If you, we do have some law, law students in the, in the room who are studying this, um, you know, one of the, the main conclusions you come to in the book is on the question of life sentences for juveniles. And I would, I would love to just get a, a one, 101 on, on that yep. practice in the United States. You've talked about it in the context of exceptionalism and that we are you know one of the only places to do that right. but I also want to talk about it from a policy perspective absolutely yeah thank you um you know so the the rationale for juvenile life without parole is um this idea of irreparable corruption mm -hmm. or permanent incorrigibility so that's the, the uh, that you're the career criminal right that right. you're Exactly. Exactly. So this idea, like in layman's terms, that you're 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 too bad to ever be good again, or what you've done is so bad that we don't even think you deserve a chance to show that you've changed, right? That you're yeah. you're irreparably broken, um, and it's really just it, it's sort of insane to say that to like a 16 year old who. Um, so leaving aside the example of my cousin for a moment, most young people who commit violent crimes are people who have been steeped in violence for a long time, right? So they're people who have violence in their homes or violence in their communities. Um, so, which is to say that they are people who are suffering trauma. And so like the idea that somebody whose brain hasn't even Finish developing, right? So the brains, I think the science now is like 25. Well, I was going to say 25, right? I'm very, as a parent also, I'm like, okay, when are my kids going <laughs> to stop doing crazy shit? Um, not, but yeah. For a long time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. not for a long time. And, and, you know, all the science I think says that um, young people age out of crime. Like even people who commit uh, violent crimes, you know, um, can, like more than one age out. Um, mm -hmm. So this idea that somebody that 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 a judge or that a sentencing board can say to somebody, you're never going to change. Mm -hmm. is just insane. It's kind of, it's just insanity. Um, it requires a kind of like fortune telling and future casting that nobody has the ability to do. And it's just quite it's actually unlikely that these that these young people, I call them children as, as often as I can, because I think like, if, have you seen a 16 year old lately? They look like children, you know, yeah. um, they are children. And so the idea that this person won't change is just incredibly unlikely. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's just, um, I guess the only other point that I would make about it from a policy perspective is that even if you could get on board with the idea um, that there are some people who are irreparably corrupt, like even if you can get on board with the underlying rationale, in practice, it's incredibly unjust because mm -hmm. some vast majority of juveniles serving life sentences without parole are Black. I think 62%. I, I don't have it in front of me, but I think it's 62%. So even if you're like, if, if you can get on board with the idea of it, it's just, we can't do it. We can't do it because we're doing it. We're doing it like we do everything else racistly and unjustly. So like, it's right. well, the question of, even if you are, if someone is seeing uh, someone as a, a child or, you know, as a 16 year old in this case, 
um, who is afforded that uh, right perception? And how often is it more likely that a white 16 year old is viewed as a 16 year old, whereas a, a black male 16 year old is viewed as a, a grown man? I, exactly. you know, it, I think on the other hand too, it's sort of in the context of, again, great, a larger conversation around mercy, which is that we don't even provide it to juveniles, right? Mm -hmm. And you could talk about the science of, you know, mm -hmm. your, your brain chemistry and all of that. But once again, everyone is deserving of, the, of that mm -hmm. sort of, uh, of mercy and, and redemption, whether they are having a mental break, whether they are a, a 16 year old, right? Whether, and I think, you know, that's, that is the direction that I would like to see this conversation mm -hmm. go, um, as well as to the very beginning of the conversation is how can we as a society, as we as a community and we as individual people, um, uh, find it within ourselves to, to yeah. view the world that way, um, without it personally affecting us, yeah. right. Without it taking, uh, your family member to become involved yeah. in the system or um, some other, you know, uh, and again, I think we talked about the importance of storytelling and that is a way that, you know, people can connect even with experiences that are not, and that is the yeah. beauty and power of books. Right. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, as I, I think for me as sort of an outsider, but someone who's a, a student of this and someone who, you know, really cares about these issues, uh, I think we've made extraordinary progress in certainly since I was in law school, right? Since um, since the days that my mom was working at the um, community law project in, in East Palo Alto. But um, I also think we're experiencing this incredible moment where we can go so much further. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, thanks to books like yours and so many other incredible advocates and leaders who are are pushing for that and not taking anything less you know, I have hope that we will see something dramatically different, um, you know, in our lifetimes and in our mm -hmm. children's lifetimes. Right. Um, and yes, uh, uh, you know, let me, <laughs> Mike, let me not get myself into uh, too much trouble in terms of being over, you know, political and, and saying mm -hmm. uh, super radical things, but like that's, I want to hear that. I want all of us to be able to uh, write, um, be open at the very least, right? To mm -hmm. again, imagining. You talked a lot about imagination yeah. and and imagining and, and seeing yeah. something outside of yourself. Absolutely. And that's, I mean, that's the thing that um, life without parole sentences really are. It's like this total negation of possibility. So there's, it's a shutting down. Right, right, right. Up, right. So it's like, it's saying to somebody, there's no, there's, there's no way that you're going to change. We don't believe that you can change. Um, and so it, it is exactly that opposite of what you're talking about, which is behind the abolition movement, you know, this idea of opening up and mm -hmm. imagining and like thinking. And can you talk about that too, in the context of just the way these systems are built, right? In terms of the prison system, where not only is that an assumption in our laws, but also that these systems within which we cage people, yeah. we're also not giving them that we, it's brutalizing and yeah. harming well, and not like, I, I'm going to get this wrong or the expert, but there's something like in Europe, there are actually re like redemptive yeah. policies and practices that are, and it, you know, that at least again, um, leave open the possibility of assuming someone can rehabilitate or, uh, you know, um, be afforded mercy. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and we don't even leave open that possibility. We just cage people and torture them. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And I think, you know, one thing that I that I always think about is that it's degrading to both the imprisoned and the imprisoner. So mm -hmm. like, I think that guards really suffer in these environments too. And one of the things that's true about some of these other countries in Europe that you alluded to is that the um, the job or the profession of prison guard is like this highly esteemed position that requires a lot of training and education. Right. So, and rightly so, right? Like if we're going to have to keep some small portion of people, and I do believe, I actually do believe that it is a small portion of people need to be imprisoned. I think most people could be diverted to programs. I think most people need, I can't even say it because I know people are just going to dismiss me as like a bleeding heart liberal, but it's just like, it is fundamentally true that most people need help. That's mm -hmm. all people. That's kind well, of again, I, I don't know how it's framed within Europe, but it is that those are social services. Those are community yeah. services. And you just spoke to it in the context of within the prison system, but also we need to provide those services to people outside of the system so that yeah. they are before, 
Exactly. Exactly. Right? Prevention. It, it's really kind of basic. Like this it's is so not basic. complicated. <laughs> it's so basic. It's just, it's not that we don't know what to do. It's that we're not willing. We haven't yeah, been yeah. willing as a country yet, you know, but we're pushing. I mean, I think we're feeling growing pains. Things are getting closer. As you said, it's, it's important not to lose sight of how much has changed. It's hard to, to hold on to that for me sometimes. Like sometimes I just see how bad it still is. Like, you know, everybody's still on the internet screaming about the death penalty and it's just like, it's like, yeah, are we still actually here? Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But I think, but, but that's only a segment of the country and there is a lot of other, you know, beautiful uh, progress that's happening. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, I want to end on a note of both that this is a crisis, our yeah. prison, our criminal legal system, yeah. and um, the harm that our prison system inflicts on our communities at the same time, um, as you and you said, as you said, like that is um, it's hard sometimes to find the the hope or the sort of, yeah. um, you know, inspiration and in, in the progress we've made. But I do want to end on, you know, what what does give you hope or who are mm-hmm other leaders, advocates, um, organizations, you know, work that's being done that, that, um, inspires you to, you know, keep doing this work. Mm. Great question. Um, where do I find hope? I think that, you know, something I mentioned, um, in the book is this idea, uh, maybe I already said this, just tell me if I'm repeating myself, but this idea of hope as a discipline Mm-hmm. You did not say that yet. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So that hope is not something that's just going to like hit us on the head when we're in a good mood. Like hope is something that we really have to work for. And so I do think, um, and I, and again, connecting it back to motherhood, like having young kids, I just feel like I can't afford to lose hope now in a way, because if I don't have hope for the world becoming better, whether it's in terms of climate change or prison reform, um, what am I doing? Like, what am I giving them? And what am I saying to them that this is a lost cause? So I just feel at this point, like hope is my, um, is my resting place now. So I can have like a bad day, but I'll come back to hope, you know? Um, And it is, I think, you know, I, I do, I, I do, I get a lot of hope from books I read and, um, and people, you know, Brian Stevenson, I think is like, I think history is going to look back and see him as one of our brightest lights. I think he is truly Absolutely. spectacular. Um, but there are a lot of other people like him who aren't as well known, who have been doing this for, for their whole lives, you know? Um, so yeah, I think surrounding ourselves with people that we can have these conversations with, you know, attending conversations that fill us up, um, mm-hmm. choosing where we put our focus, like, are you going to put your focus in the comment section? Or are you going to put your focus on whatever, you know, your, your loved one? Um, and, um, and yeah, so those are some tools that I think, I think I just feel like I can't afford to live without hope anymore. It's not an option. Yeah. Well, Catherine, again, thank you so much uh, mm-hmm. for, for doing this and for writing this book. Congratulations. Mm-hmm. Uh, want to remind people that you can buy this at Harvard Bookstore, the host of our event. It is a wonderful gift for law students, for mm-hmm. anyone who is interested um, to understand you know, the system from the perspective, a really deeply personal perspective and from the lens of um, mercy and and redemption and um just in such a beautiful way um and and really uh brave and honest way that you've you've put through in this book so thank you Catherine um I know we have a little bit of time left for Q&A Claire are you gonna yeah yeah I can ask some questions here that was a wonderful conversation thank you Mina Uh, thank you thank you (laughs) my honor okay um we have some questions from the audience um so uh, the first one is, uh, what was the most surprising thing about um, publishing your book? Oh, the most surprising thing. Um, you know, I have loved hearing from individual readers so much. Um, and though the book has only been out for six days, I have been um, really struck by people sharing their stories with me and some Sometimes it's people I know, sometimes it's people um, that I don't know who are passing along a story, but in particular, stories of, um, of their family members 
committing violence. Um, I've been really, I've just been so struck that this happens more than I think we think it does. Um, so, so many people have, have gotten in touch and said like, oh, you know, my friend's husband had a psychotic break and killed four people, or, you know, that was the story that was passed on to me today. Um, this is not something, this is, this happens, this happens. And I think the thing that that gives me is a sense of, um, I guess the, the reason that I think it's important to share our stories is so that we know we're not alone. And hearing from people has made me know that, you know, my family is not alone in this experience. Um, and therefore, I hope um, when people read about like a story that they can identify with in a book, I hope that people will know um, that they don't need to be ashamed, you know, because I think this is something that people are so ashamed of. So anyway, um, that's probably been the most surprising thing and a really and a really lovely thing of having the book out in the world. Yeah, it sort of leads question. into the sort of next question, which is, has your family been supportive as you've been publishing this book? Um, it, it's <laughs> yes and no. Um, some members of my family have been supportive and some have not. And I think that's entirely fair because I think, you know, it is not anybody's job to get on board with somebody who's going to write a memoir about her family. Yeah, yeah. And we just, we still, you know, we live in a, in a culture that often feels like, like family secrets should stay secret. Um, and, um, and I understand that. And so, yeah, I, I come from a divided, divided <laughs> yeah. house right now. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> did anything you learn, you touched on this a little bit when you were chatting earlier with Mina, but did anything you learned during the writing of this book change your feelings about the criminal justice system? Was there any sort of moment you're like, oh, I kind of shifted where I was thinking? Um, during the writing of the book? During, during the writing, because okay. sort of you've worked in this space for so long. Sure. Um, well, I don't know. That's such an interesting question. I have to put myself back in the mind, in the headspace of what it was like writing. Um, I think, and I, this is probably not going to be a very popular answer, but I think mostly what I felt was grateful to be writing about it and not in it, you know, like not practicing, not, um, not immersed in it, not like advocating for this policy or that policy on Capitol Hill. Um, it felt like a much truer, this is just a personal standpoint. We can't, you know, everybody has to find their place and their role and the work that feels right to them. For me, writing about this has felt um, much more um, true than, um, than like arguing for this policy or that policy. I, I hope to be able to do both in my life still, you know, but, yeah. um, but I felt, I felt grateful to be able to take the space of a whole book rather than say like a policy paper or, you know, taking some position, a book gives you time and space to really explore nuance and all these gray areas, yeah. um, which the law and the, and the criminal legal system doesn't often embrace. Yeah. Um, you know, if you could wave a magic wand and mm -hmm. change something, a policy, a law, whatever, not specifically like the past of what happened, sure. but like something that yeah. could be changed, yeah. uh, theoretically be changed, yeah. um, what, what, what would you change? Yeah. I mean, this is probably an unsurprising answer, but I do think um, one of the first, and this is a low hanging fruit, but um, life sentences without parole really don't need them. We really can offer people the opportunity for parole and deny it if we think that that person is not safe yeah. to be out you know, in the world. We don't actually need to say at this point that that can never, that that's not a possibility. So I think because, because we don't need it, it can go and it can go right away. And I think if I could, if I could change something um, overnight, that's what I would, that's what I would say. Yeah. Um, we have some other questions here sort of related to that. Here's one. Um, is there any rehabilitation baked into the current system? And, you know, yeah. what might that look like? There are, you know, there are some much more promising programs. I think I mentioned diversion at one point. So um, sometimes juveniles, uh, especially juveniles who stay in the juvenile justice system instead of, um, instead of being funneled to the adult criminal system, um, they can be diverted to programs. And the most promising programs, I think, are programs that keep 
children in their communities. Um, other promising programs for adults include things like uh, drug court or um, veterans courts, you know, so these are judges who are especially focusing on this kind of population, on these kinds of people. Um, so, so all of those, all of those diversions have uh, more of a focus on rehabilitation. And then I should say too, in prison, in maximum security prisons, you can seek out um, programming and depending on where you are and depending on like what your security level is. Um, so my cousin has been able to take classes and you know victim awareness classes and things like that. So there are avenues. It, it seems like you have to work really hard to find them and that, sh that it doesn't make sense, right? And then of course they are absolutely absent at some facilities and detention centers at some prisons. Um, there's just such a wide variety of environments right now. All right, some sort of take a little shift in some questions here. Um, what kind of person would you recommend law school to? Both you and Mina talked a little bit about law school, so yeah. that came up in the questions. <laughs> yeah, wonderful question. Um, you know, there's this kind of like um, trendy thing that people who have been to law school do where they they say like, don't go to law school, you know, like spare yourself. I've never really been a fan of that because I think if you feel called to go to law school, you should go. The thing that is really real is this question of debt. So like, you know, if you can, if you can find a way to go to law school and not come out with three years of debt, that then chains you to working at a firm for the next 10 years of your life to pay off that debt, that would be ideal. <laughs> and we just have a system that makes that really, really hard. Um, so but I think, you know, more people should have legal educations. I think it's a really like powerful education to have. If you understand the law, then you understand a lot about how society works and you can choose what lever you want to pull in terms of being an advocate or somebody who's interested in making change. Um, I wish that law school was two years. I wish that it was widely accessible to um, all different kinds of people. And um, I wish it was much less expensive. Yeah. <laughs> Right, and, and and one last question here. Um, so you spoke a little bit about Brian Stevenson and his influence and his book's influence on, yeah. on your work. Um, but this book is, is a memoir in a lot mm -hmm. of ways. Um, and were there any memoirs that influenced you or favorite memoirs that you were thinking about while you were writing? Um, that's a great question. I, I love Maggie Nelson. Um, her book, The Argonauts, um, really, is like a, is much more a memoir than some of her other books, which are more criticism. Um, and what I love about that book is that it is just entirely steeped in possibility, both in terms of its form. So as a writer, I think I read that book and was blown away because it gave me the sense that, oh, you mean you can just write it however you want? <laughs> like you can just write, you can just write the book how you want to write it, you know? Wow, that's amazing. Um, but then also, you know, the content is about possibility. Like she's talking about how she made her family. Um, and so it's a, it's a book about freedom and love and family making, and I think ultimately possibility. And that, that book was really freeing to me. So that's one that comes to mind. Oh, there are lots of others. There's so many beautiful <laughs> memoirs. I could, I mean, Jasmine Ward's book, um, is, is another, um, I, I won't go on and on, but, but yes. I, I, I didn't read, weirdly, I didn't read a ton of memoir because I just felt like I didn't want to um, be too influenced. Um, but I do love the personal essay and I do love poetry, which can often be sort of like memoir. And so I read a lot of poetry as I wrote this book. That's wonderful. Um, so I think we're out of time, but I just wanted to thank you once again and, and also thank Mina um and for i want to thank everyone out there who's spent your evening with us yeah um you can learn more about and um, purchase the uninnocent on harvard.com or via the link in the chat and so on behalf of harvard bookstore in cambridge massachusetts i hope everyone out there has a great night keep reading and um please be well thanks so much thank you Catherine. thank you, thank you claire good night